Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Day Zero Podcast. I'm Spectre with me as Z. Uh, today, we have some bugs in uh, the new e baby monitor, uh, Grafana Sea Surf, a uh, really silly crypto bug, as well as um, a Twitter de anonymization issue. So, we'll start off with the Grafana issue, uh, which I'll pass over to Z. Yeah, this, I'll be honest, there's, it's not all that common when I read one of these reports, and I won't say it like it blew my mind, but there was one point in this report that genuinely surprised me. Uh, I kind of added this report, it's like, yeah, let's talk about this, because you'll notice in the title, this is a cross-origin request forgery against Grafana, versus what you might be more used to hearing, cross-site request forgery. Frankly, we're dealing with the same sort of issue, the idea here being that Gravana API doesn't really do anything that makes their request unique, like a C-Surf token, so there's no, or, there's no sort of authenticity checking to make sure that a user actually started the request. But they do implement two mitigations that generally offer some sort of protection against those attacks, being uh, same site cookies and checking the content type header. Same site cookies being the big one that are always like, oh, this is going to kill C-Surf. That said, they actually point out here, uh, I think this is Julian or Juob's, uh, something something like that, uh, <laughs> kind of points out here, basically this is, and as I said, this is impacting all of the get and post endpoints in the Grafana API. The issue here is really just more of a chance to talk about, like, even with same site cookies, you're not entirely protected from that C surf style of attack. And I thought that was worth kind of calling out here because you might be tempted to think, well, and this is especially important, I think, with bug bounty hunters because you usually have a pretty large scope. But the way that site, so the difference between site and origin is kind of what matters here. Uh, you can't attach so same site will send those cookies sent the send the uh protected cookies on a same site navigation so like you know you're on google you click on another link on google it'll send the cookies but how does it actually determine what the same site is it turns out that you might kind of naively as i did think that site and origin are kind of the same thing and origin being the same scheme the same host the same port so effectively, you're connecting to the same place every time, and that's when it'll send it. What's actually going on here, um, also out of chat, uh, Rudimal asked, Grafana is some sort of metrics log aggregate? Yeah, um, I believe it's kind of... I'd want to say it's almost like a front end, so you would have... So I haven't used Grafana, so I do apologize if I get this wrong, but my understanding is that it would basically come around as a... Uh, just like a visualization or a front end to having your logs fed in from somewhere else. Uh, that's kind of my understanding of where it fits in. Um, the actual issue, like, it doesn't really have anything to... This could be any sort of application that you self-host. The issue comes down to this difference between what's an origin versus a site. Um, and kind of how that same site navigation works. So as, I, as I was just saying, the origin is the same scheme, same host, same port. Those three things need to be the same, and then you can access like any path, query parameters don't matter, but those three things need to match. But a same site is a lot more uh, widely scoped. The same site is actually the effect of top-level domain plus one. What does that mean? Um... What it ultimately ends up meaning is they'll use the uh, public suffix list, which I had remembered hearing about a long time ago, and then just like, oh, okay, that's interesting, but, you know, what does that matter? Public suffix list, effectively, so ETL, ETLD plus one is going to be your, you can think of a suffix like .org, org would be a public suffix, anybody can register something under org, or, you know, com or net or whatever, those are your suffixes, they're public suffixes. Um, or suffixes, what, however, <laughs> however you do the plural there, um, you'll have kind of the most specific public one, so could be your top level, just like that com org net, plus one being like, in our case, for day zero, day zero sec.com, that would be our site. 
problem there is what about subdomains? Subdomains are actually going to be considered as the same site. So like a.day0sec.com and b.day0sec.com are the same site as far as same site cookies are concerned. Um, and that isn't exactly true. The reason why this public suffix list kind of matters is that sites like github.io is the example used in this post. Those will also be on the public suffix list. Anybody can kind of have their own subdomain under github.io or whatever other common suffix you might see. Those can be registered there also. So then um, you wouldn't be able to attack, say, other github.io subdomains. It would have to be a subdomain under your subdomain. So it's just kind of adding on the one custom part. That said, on especially on bug bounty type hunting, this gives you a ton of scope to find ways of actually abusing these CSERF issues when they're using same site cookies. So I spent a long time on that to basically say subdomains give you a lot of attack surface, especially when you're not limited to just attacking that single uh, source or that single location. The other thing in this post, and this was the one that genuinely surprised me, was that they were also checking the header, the content type header, for it to be uh, uh, like application slash JSON being the normal case to come in there. And I thought, and this was definitely a firmly held belief on my side, that you cannot modify that content type header without initiating a uh, core's pre-flight request. I'll go and ask, like, are they allowed to edit this header? Most sites aren't going to let you do that. Turns out that's not true, at least with the newer fetch API. Instead, what it actually indicates in the spec is that the essence of the content type header needs to be one of, so there's kind of the three usual suspects when it comes to content type that you are allowed to use that are considered relatively safe that you can go ahead and set on without needing to do a course reflect. That's your like text plane, the XWW form URL encoded, and um, multi-par form data. Three fairly common ones. Those don't need to have a pre-flight. So checking for application JSON would require that you have a pre-flight, which is just going to reject the attack outright. Turns out with, with the fetch API, it just needs to be the essence. So what does that mean? That effectively means you can start it with text plane, semicolon, application JSON, and that would pass through because the essence of it is still the text plane. Um, it, honestly, like it, it's such a small thing, but because I've held that belief for so long, it genuinely surprised me that that was allowed here. And you can imagine where that can go wrong. If something only looks for the JSON keyword in the content type, Header, then you'll be left with the case where you can effectively spoof it or get around it. And of course, it's pretty common to see that in like Python code where you can just type like word in string and see if it comes up, which is exactly what Grafana was doing. They only looked for the presence of JSON in the content type header, expecting that you couldn't change it to something, you know, more complicated uh, like application JSON without having the course preflight happen. So, I mean, it, it's a small thing, but I think just worth being aware of at this point, because especially, I think this is specific to the Fetch API. Um, I didn't have a chance to go and check if that was true if you're using uh, the older APIs for doing these cross-site requests, but at least with Fetch, you can change that content type and at least append other attributes onto it, which is absolutely a worthwhile trick to be aware of, and I had frankly, no idea about that. Yeah, you, you could basically smuggle it in on the end. Um, the thing is, it it does seem like something that's only going to work in specific cases. Um, like sure. The only reason it was exploitable here was because of how stupid the parsing was uh, with their Go code, where they would just check if the string contained JSON. Um, but that and a lot of other stupid. setups... Go I, ahead, sorry. I don't know. I, I disagree. I think they should be checking the entire content type, um, but... I, I guess hindsight's twenty twenty there too. Maybe maybe that's uh, unfair. But yeah, so I mean, I would I would kind of look at it this way. I was really thinking with the Python case of using that in keyword. I can use, and I've I'm sure I've done this myself. 
I'll have something. I'm like, well, I'm pretty sure this type is application JSON or, you know, the MIME types, whatever. Like, well, can it be text slash JSON? Can it be this or that? I don't want to go Google it. So I just go, well, is JSON in there or is slash JSON in there is probably what I do. Um, and then I'm kind of just handling all those other edge cases of like, what other protocols might they decide to use or send across to me? And that's where I can end up being left with a, you know, is JSON in here and performing that sort of thing. But you are right. Like this is limited to those that also aren't checking the entire content type and some languages make it easier than others to actually do that. Um, like, I mean, a lot of languages, it's going to be more natural to do a double equals application JSON than doing this sort of string contains. So it is very limited, but it is worth knowing that you can do this because I'm sure other places are going to do this also. Yeah, and I just wanted to uh, expand on that a little bit and just say maybe part of the reason I thought this was so naive is because I've been bitten by this exact same problem before, not in this context of checking content type, um, but in something else I was doing. It was like a disassembler type thing. Um, I, I initially tried doing like a strings.contains and then I was like, oh, wait, I have this problem where um, there's things that are containing it, but I have other cases that I want to check. So since that and some of those problems that I've encountered, I just try to avoid like that kind of checking across the board if I can manage it, um, because it's just it, it seems too error prone to me um, in any context where that data can be somewhat arbitrary, which in this case with the content type, it can be. So, Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, it, it's, but it's one of those cases where as a developer, you might think with well, this way, I'm handling like those edge cases, like text JSON or something weird like that. Don't know why it would be sent, but not entirely sure it wouldn't be. Um, but I agree. Like the better practice is doing the exact comparison. That way you don't have this wiggle room. Or at least, like, a, in this case, it starts with. Um, although, yeah, that wouldn't have worked with what their strings are right now, but they easily could have turned all of these into at least a starts with to do the comparison with. But that requires kind of, that's really a hindsight thing. We know that you can append, but not being able to change that start out or that starting bit of the string. Yeah. Uh, jumping back a little bit, the other thing I thought I'd point out from the post that they highlight a bit earlier on after they uh, talk about the attack that Z was talking about with subdomains, the other thing is same site on its own just isn't really enough um, because like it's it's totally possible that a Grafana admin could decide to change the same site value or disable it outright. And while most browsers will have the default same site attribute set to lax, um, which is what Gravana sets it to by default as well. Um, there's some browsers like Safari that still don't do that. So, yeah, because of that, the same site would be set to none effectively on uh, Safari, or it just wouldn't be recognized. And uh, yeah, that same site just doesn't protect you anymore because it, it might be unset. Um, on top of that, it's possible for like an XSS or something or similar to be used to get around same site um, or for Grafana admins to enable iframe embed. So, I mean, yeah, so there were saying... a few different like bypass vectors they detailed there, but I just wanted to throw those in there. They they weren't like the main focus though. Um, the their main like talking point was that cross origin uh, tail. Yeah, but you call it an important thing with regards to same site being a mitigation and not a complete defense. But I do also want to say that saying like oh XSS will get around like yeah, but XSS is a more serious issue than cross site request forgery because XSS gives you that arbitrary JavaScript on a client, whereas cross-site request forgery is just pages, like it's just the limited requests that you can make using it. Um, so generally speaking, if you have XSS, that's just the more serious issue. It's not really a bypass for CSERF or for CORF, I guess, in this case. Um, but when it comes to the mitigations, like, yeah, same site is not, and same deal with that content type, like checking content type for a long time, I saw people like treating it as though that was the security mechanism. Like, you know, as long as you're doing that, you're fine. And yeah, there aren't a ton of ways to bypass it. Now with the fetch API, it looks like that's not as true depending on how it's done. But generally speaking, these are like band-aids that you can put over something. You should still be doing the usual CSER protection 
Um, and these are defense and depth options. You add this on, in addition to if you had some other issue, now it can't even be exploited without needing to deal with this also. Yeah. So uh, those two issues together, um, well, I guess kind of those two issues, mainly the uh, the ability to get around same site, either by using subdomain or some other method, um, as well as the naive parsing, uh, allowed them to pock this and, and demonstrate that it worked. Um, it was kind of funny because they stumbled onto the like the course pre-flight code and that bug in the parsing um, because they, they tried to pop pocket initially and they got an HTTP error. They got 422 um, unprocessable entry response, which prompted them to think, okay, we can only send JSON here. Um, and then, or, or that kind of got them thinking about the content type. Um, when they tried setting the content type to uh text plane encoding, um, that's when they got the unsupported media types that kind of led them down that path. Um if they never tried to pocket, they might not have discovered that issue. So, yeah, I just thought that w that was a little bit funny. But, um, yeah, kind of a chain of little issues here that um, led to it being exploitable when the vendor might have thought that it, they were they were safe from that. So. Yeah, or at least it's exploitable as long as you have that another sort of vulnerability on um, the same site. Just... Yeah, diff different origin, but same site. It does require that, and that is a limiting factor, but as I've said a couple times, especially with bug bounties, you usually have a big scope, and subdomains are generally not impossible to get. Uh, to find some issue with, you just need some issue that'll allow for... Um, oh, what... There's a name for the attack now of uh, crafting. Basically, being able to arbitrarily cause another client to make requests. I forget the name. I want to say it's OORF, but I can't remember. Or OSRF, off-site request forgery, maybe. Um, yeah, I can't remember what exactly the name of it is, but... Yeah, sorry, I can't help you there. I'm not too good with the word soup stuff, so... <laughs> yeah. Um... I'm not sure what the term is. On sorry, on site request forgery, OSRF. So that's where you have one website. On that site, you can cause it to uh, make a request or forge a request to another site. Um, so there you go. OSRF, if you want to look into that a little bit. Okay, there we go. Today I learned a term. And with that, we'll uh, we'll move into our next topic here, which is a post by Bitdefender on four vulnerabilities in uh, Nui Baby Monitor, um, three of which were higher level issues, one of which was a binary level issue being a stack overflow, which we'll, we'll kind of skip over in this episode, but if you're interested, it's there. Um, it, it's not a super interesting vulnerability anyway, as far as, uh, you know, memory corruption goes. Um, the first bug they detail is one that kind of enables exploitation of the others in a sense, um, or at least makes it easier. And that's an info leak that leaks device and user IDs from the uh, the MQTT server that the cameras connect to. This one's really simple. Um, the server just doesn't require any authentication to communicate with it. And so by just subscribing to the uh, device init topic, you can just obtain IDs for all devices that connect to the server. <laughs> um, so just kind of an access control issue. Pretty straightforward. Um, the second bug was... But I mean... How do you resolve that exactly? Like, just that issue is, one, I'm probably not just publishing everything, like, not being able to let people just subscribe to it. Um, but at the same time, like, the Mosquito server does need to be online and internet accessible and any sort of credentials that you gave the client. Like, this is an IoT device, an attacker can figure out those credentials, so you can't just do, like, an authenticated connection. Um... So while I can understand, I, I'd argue more like they should limit it versus they don't really mention what their mitigations are, but they call out the fact that the server doesn't require authentication. And my thought on that statement is just like, you, there's no strong authentication you can really do besides um, like just client, like isolating each authenticated account. Because um, any password that they were to use is going to be discoverable on that IoT device. Uh, Granted, some of the other issues make that maybe, a little bit maybe irrelevant. I don't, maybe I don't fully understand what you're pointing out here, because I think you could secure that, like, like encryption would work here. Like, you could have per device 
Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Well, I'm just trying to think of the setup. But, but so you have having per device authentication. Yeah, I mean having some sort of key per device, um, so that it just authenticates with it. Having the mosquito server being publicly accessible is kind of a necessity. Although allowing subscription over anything arbitrary, there are certain restrictions on the sort of message queue that I would say should be there. Like that shouldn't be there. It's just the authentication aspect. I don't think is the key to it. Oh no, maybe you, maybe you think I... it's more of a design issue, I guess. Like just allowing that that um endpoint to be exposed. Yeah, I guess you could kind of go both ways on it. Um the setup is a little bit weird here, so it's yeah, it's an interesting point to bring up for sure. Yeah. But uh yeah, the second issue is a little bit more straightforward than um with being another access control issue being the fact that you could send commands um, such as the command to request a live feed to a destination URL um, to arbitrary device IDs again with no authentication. Um, so this is a, a functionality that should be isolated to like a per device communication um, with like authorization behind it because yeah, by using the first bug to get like a device or user ID um, you could then use the second issue to do something actually useful with it, um, such as getting a, you know, a camera feed. Um, the other high level issue is the fact that uh, Nui.com has an endpoint to obtain an AWS token um, used for storing recordings on the cloud. And all you need to access that endpoint is the IDs, um, which you could get from the first issue. Um, and that can allow you to get the AWS token. And on top of that, that token isn't really configured properly, or the, at least that's what they believe, um, because not only does it grant access to that device's uploads, it has access to the entire bucket. So you can get access to uploads from all the cameras or devices um, that are attached to to that token. So yeah, just a bunch of like really simple issues, although um, the, the way the design is, especially with the first bug, um, it, it's kind of a simple issue, but maybe a bit harder to implement you know what? the fix for. I'm going but... to retract kind of my statement there actually when it comes to the authentication. Um, I was kind of thinking uh, thinking of it from the perspective of, well, that server needs to be accessible basically to any random camera, but you very lightly touched on crypto. And yeah, you can give every device, just give it a, basically give them custom keys uh, or give them a certificate that's been signed by them. That gives a way to kind of validate the data that's on it. They all have their custom IDs already anyhow. Have that be signed. You can then connect them like kind of one-to-one -one and not have any of this cross-account issue. So yeah, I I'm going to take back my statements earlier about authentication. Um, as frankly just being wrong. Um, as for the issues here though, the fact that they have different S3 keys and they still have like all because every cam there are specific AWS credentials per camera and they're all just allowing access to the entire bucket. Why? How? Like you created different credentials. <laughs> like how does this one even happen? Yeah, um, it seems like a really bad um token configuration. Like <laughs> I don't know what they would be doing here to make this like final bug that they covered an issue, but yeah, that one, that one was really, it, it really stood out to me um, among the others. Like all of them are kind of meme bugs a little bit, but the, the token one, like you said, it seems like they tried to do it. Like they, they thought of this exact scenario, but just completely <laughs> failed on implementing it. So yeah, and yeah. I mean, since I raised the question of how, I could imagine it being a developer sits there and like while well, they're early in implementation, just like has it generate this generic key because they don't know like how the UIDs are going to map to buckets yet or something. And then because that means it always works, if they didn't do any test cases, I'm assuming they had some testing at least, but they only tested for like success and things are working, it would have worked in every case, and thus nobody noticed after a while that that was happening. Um that's how I can imagine something like this getting introduced. But yeah, it is such a silly issue, but it's also pretty common to have keys that just are overly scoped within cloud work. Like, that is one of the more common issues we've seen with a lot of cloud things is just bad permissions and just identity and authentication issues in general. 
Yeah, and to be fair, like we've talked about this before too, it is a little bit harder to audit for. Um, like when you get into this cloud stuff and the fine grained permission sets that it allows, it's so easy to get lost in it and just not really realize how much permission you might be giving to a, a given token with like the scopes that you give it. Um, cloud is just really, it's so easy to mismanage um, tokens. Yeah, because they're trying to fit like everybody's needs. It is, frankly, just overly complicated in terms of what you give these tokens access to and what everything can do. And there's just so much no. I mean, it is literally its own position at this point. It's just like that cloud security specialist or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I'll just touch on it. I know you s completely skipped over it, but for anybody interested, um, the buffer overflow issue was just a mem copy, unbounded mem copy into a fixed size buffer. Um, on the stack, so red to libc, no ASLR did have. I think it had NX because they do a red to libc attack. Um, but that might not have even been the case. It might have just been easier to get that system gadget. Uh, not a lot of interesting there, but they do kind of walk through it a little bit. If you're new to it, might be worth giving it a read or just curious. Might be worth um. Usually, when we cover those issues, we go into more interesting issues on our Tuesday episode. Yeah, this one's uh, fairly like basic and straightforward as far as uh, memory corruption goes and exploiting it. All right, so uh, next we have a Hacker One report submitted to Twitter, and it was a bug that allowed Twitter users to be de-anonymized in a sense um, because it allowed discoverability of accounts through uh, phone numbers or emails. Um, and it kind of stems through the duplicate account checking um, in the account creation login flow. And, and because of that, it completely bypasses a potential victim's privacy settings, which could have uh, this discoverability disabled. Um, the problem lies in the uh, task.json login flow in the Twitter API. Um, now, this is seems a little bit specific to like how Twitter's authentication works. I'm not super familiar with login flow. Um, I, I don't know if, if you are Z. So but. it is somewhat specific to that, but I don't think the concept is. Because um, what I thought when I read this report is, yes, like this specific case is like they have this Android, or this is basically the API that the Android client is using when you go to register, give it your, um, uh, they have this subtask of login, enter user identifier, that's where you enter like your phone number, your email goes through, and then when you submit that, it's going to check as a sub-check, it's going to do this account duplication check that just looks like, is this actually, like, a new account? If it's not, shows the user ID for the actual account, thus giving, effectively, the user's account, or it's good enough to be able to figure out all of their accounts. But the concept that I thought is important now with this one is kind of like the back door or the side entrance to similar functionalities. They have the privacy setting, to not be discoverable by, like, email, by phone number. That's a privacy setting. You can turn it off, and this works regardless of that, because this is kind of like a side door to that functionality. It's another place that looks up accounts and, you know, takes into account that email or that phone number without actually being the account discovery functionality, and thus is likely to have different security mechanisms in place and different checks in place as is this case where they just forgot to actually take that into account before they revealed the user ID. Um, so that was the more important thing I think to get out of this report is just the fact that like it, these side doors and other ways of getting the same information are always kind of worth exploring a little bit because it, it I've seen this sort of issue a number of times actually with different account registrations and discoverability being a means of leaking information. Reasonably common. So that is com that's common, although the specifics of like these requests are not common. Like that's specific to the Twitter API. Yeah. Um, so basically how that attack works is you can get a login flow created by sending a request to that onboarding uh, task.json endpoint. You get a flow token which you can then use to submit your own request to that endpoint with a user identifier. So that can be like a phone number or a username or email or whatever. Um, and if it's a valid user, the endpoint returns a response with the user ID. Um, and on Twitter, it's it's very easy to convert a user ID to a handle. Um, if I remember correctly, the 
the URL decoding, like Twitter supports it out of the box. If you just do twitter.com slash ID, it'll take you to the profile. So, or, or, or the handle. So yeah, not hard to, to get that ID to, uh, decoded to a user account. Um, and so, yeah, an attacker could use this to basically create a database of emails or phone numbers, Twitter accounts, uh, which is a fairly serious issue. Um, I think what you were saying there with the side door, that's a pretty succinct way of putting it. Um, that's a, uh, that's a good, that's a good term for this. So yeah, because this issue was such a serious issue, it was awarded a $5,000 bounty, a little bit surprising to see this in Twitter. Um, I don't know. I, I guess we say that a lot when, whenever it's like a major platform, but this did seem a little bit too easy. Like this is not a complex attack at all. It's literally you get a token, you use that token. <laughs> it's, no, but um, didn't we cover a kind of easy uh, MFA bypass in Twitter also? Isn't there something like that? Um, I think I I don't remember what it was. I I don't know. I wasn't entirely surprised by it. On two points: one, this is the API specifically that's used by Android clients. So you know, you just log in on your computer. You're going to test the easiest API. That's going to be the desktop API. That's going to be your browser's API. What it uses versus the Android one. So there's a little bit of the obscurity. It's being a little bit behind doors. The account registration isn't something people necessarily check. I mean, it's something that should be checked quite often, but they often look for more complex features and functionality, whereas they already have their account registered. So, I don't know. These sorts of issues do tend to slip by in, like, forgot password, in registration code, in part because it's not the interesting functionality. At least that's my theory on it, obviously. I have no studies or something to back off uh, any statistics on how often somebody or why people choose whatever. But I don't know. This one didn't feel all that surprising to me, actually. That's fair to point out that it was in the, the Android client API. That that could be like a major factor into why it wasn't discovered earlier. So, yeah, fair call out. Um yeah, to, to me personally, like this, this just seemed a little bit too easy because, like I said, you get a token, you send a request, um, and you just you can pass in whatever you want for the user identifier, like whichever, like phone number, email, and yeah, just uh, a little bit of a like a design level issue in this specific API. So yeah, uh, we have one more topic for the episode, which is a crypto uh, based bug. It's a, it's it's a really stupid smart contract bug that led to. I believe about, yeah, about 300,000 uh, US dollars being stolen. So, you know, in terms of impact, this is probably at the top for the episode. Um, Z, you, you discovered this topic yesterday, so I'll, I'll let you jump into this one too. Um, I'll also answer a quick question out of chat. I thought we had a Spotify description here, but um, asked where can I subscribe to an audio version of this podcast? Um, on dayzerosec.com, we have... Uh, there's a little headphone link for like all of our audio sources, but yes, yeah, Spotify, Google, Apple Podcasts, um, all of the usual places. If we're not somewhere, feel free to reach out and like ask us to figure out how to add ourselves on some platform. Uh, but yeah, it's available there, same timing as we upload on YouTube and elsewhere. As for this vulnerability, um, this is actually our spot the vault for the week also, um, or it's exactly where I got the code from. And yeah, they managed to get just under 300,000, which... Maybe isn't the largest crypto bugs. You often see these crypto bugs being like millions or I think there was one not too long ago that was a couple billion. Not the largest. That said, it's another one of those kind of stupid issues. And what happened here is this make hop. So the idea is you have the staking pool, people buy into it, they give rewards for holding for like keeping their money in there. Simple idea. And then they could also move around between these different pools that implement the iStaking interface. All that means is it implements one of two, or it implements two important functions, make hop and receive hop. As long as it does that, you can transfer over to that contract. The issue is, uh, well, the issue as they kind of do it in their postmortem is that it assumes that there cannot be a malicious smart contract on the pool that is called on receive hop pool. So that is... Uh, this line here, unfortunately, for those of you listening, it's kind of the last line of make hop after it's done all of its um, internal accounting. So out in chat before the episode started, uh, I believe it was Amuzink who mentioned it as being a possible re-entrancy attack. Uh, 
since they do the accounting in remove shares, they call that before they actually go to the new pool and actually call out or hand over control to some other contract. Because of that, um, basically, even if you call this multiple times and did a reentrancy attack, there would be no shares to pay out. You couldn't get paid out multiple times. Instead, what happens here is after it does that accounting, it'll call this approve for it'll say basically this new pool address it is allowed to transfer that's what the dot approve does it's basically saying this next account they can make a transfer of this whatever amount you tell it and then that other account can actually make that transfer after that fact well they say they can take the total supply of the staking pool or of like the token pool all of it can be transferred by this new pool and then they go ahead and tell the new pool that they should receive the hop just for a particular amount um but you can create your own contract implement the interface and basically um just tell it to transfer all of the money out of it and not care about what the amount you're supposed to receive was um because yeah, they're basically saying you're approved to transfer whatever the heck you want it doesn't have to only be this amount uh so simple issue straightforward issue and really stupid to see it uh that seems like the case with a lot of crypto issues although most that we've covered have been at least a little bit more complex yeah so this one like from the outside if you're not familiar with bar contracts you might not spot it right away um at least if that you know, error here comment wasn't there to kind of hit you in the right direction. Um, it, it kind of requires a bit of knowledge of how like approve works. Um, and, you know, I've been learning a little bit of crypto recently and um, it's kind of fresh in, in my memory because of that. But yeah, this seems like a really impossible bug to overlook if you're doing any auditing on like smart, con smart contract stuff, which you should be considering you're dealing with financials. You're dealing with lots of money. Um, this is a really costly mistake to have. Obviously, um, like you said, we've seen more impact, like more damaging attacks in the past. But three hundred thousand dollars isn't nothing to scoff at either. So, yeah, I mean, just uh, as even as far as smart contract bugs go, I think this one is like just way too out in the open and way too easy to. to, to happen on so yeah i don't know i i'm guessing this wasn't audited like at all because i don't see how this would have slipped by so yeah i mean it's really just trusting that the other party is going to operate appropriately um which you shouldn't really trust on <laughs> uh amazon out of chat asks uh, is there a better way of illustrating this before moving directly to code I'm not sure, because, I mean, the issue here, I think, is pretty clear in the code, and it's just, at least in my opinion, the issue is just the fact that it does an approval for the entire, or total supply, instead of just the amount that it's actually expecting to be moved. Um, I feel like that's, we can show this in the code, I'm not sure if there's another good way of illustrating that. I think the concept, um, and this is where I think you need a little bit of crypto background, is the concept of like this new pool, like anybody can implement the I staking interface and like deploy their own contract doing that. There's no authentication on that point. Uh, that kind of requires just knowing a bit of crypto. I'm not sure um, if there's a better way to illustrate it. If somebody has some thoughts on illustrating something, it's really illustrating any um, vulnerability though, I always be kind of willing to hear that out especially as i'm trying to describe some of them on, on audio and that's not always the easiest but this one i feel like the code just kind of shows that they approve for way too much yeah i think where the issue is so simple in a sense um i think if you tried to do like a well, I guess they, oh, okay, they do have a diagram here. I, I didn't see that right away. There's a the diagram, that. but it kind of just shows the flow here where they call, you know, make hop, and then they have like contract B receiving it and draining the funds. It doesn't really show the issue, it just shows the flow. Yeah. So that, that's what I was going to kind of get into is the fact that I think if you tried to do like a diagram of this, it would almost be a little bit more confusing. Like it would make the issue seem more complex than it actually is. So, 
yeah, I think this one would be harder to to do, to do like a like a diagram or something for. So, yeah, I mean, pretty uh, pretty straightforward issue to end off the episode, but financially damning. So, yeah, type of, yeah, uh, type I, I kind of like. want to include it as because we've covered poorly in the past some um, crypto bugs. Uh, like I mentioned, we're both kind of getting a little bit more into the crypto issues. So I kind of want to call it out here on our bounty issue because there are some very big bounties being offered within the crypto scene because there is so much money being involved. And once these are deployed, it's not easy to patch. I mean, there are proxy contracts, so they can do some patching now. But like once this code's deployed, like it's there and it's permanently on the chain. Um, so they do need the auditing. So they offer some pretty big bounties when it comes to these sorts of issues. Um, and they're not all like crazy bugs like we've talked about in the past. There's plenty of these really stupid, simple issues that you can be looking for too. Yeah, I mean, we covered a, a blog post within the last couple of weeks that was another crypto issue. And I think the bounty was like 1.4 million or something. And it was, I think it was the largest bounty that we've covered anyway. So yeah, the crypto yeah. space has a lot of money in it. But yeah. Uh, with that said, that's pretty much everything that we have for the Bounty episode for this week. So thanks for everyone who tuned in. The VOD will be up on YouTube and Spotify and whatnot tomorrow. Um, you can also find more links on our site with the with the headphone icon that Z mentioned a bit earlier. Um, you can also feel free to check out our Discord and follow us on Twitter uh, for when we go live or for any discussion that you might want to have um, kind of tacking on there. If you have some ideas for how some bugs could be illustrated, uh, especially like crypto stuff, um, yeah, drop it in our Discord, because like Z said, we'd, we'd be interested in that for sure. Um, so links for those are down below or in the chat as well. Um, tomorrow one, we'll be... Sorry, oh, one ahead. minor correction, I guess. It's not a headphone icon. That was their old site design. Now it just says listen on the bottom left side. Oh, you're right. I was thinking of the old site design too, with the icons. Um, okay, fair clarification though. Um, but yeah, um, tomorrow we'll be back with our binary episode at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, which is where we'll get into more of the low-level topics. Um, and yeah, we'll see you all then.